co uh, host Jeff Schomeyer. We are uh, once again joining you uh, for Read Science to talk about um, how these wonderful science authors we are lucky enough to uh, gather with us uh, do their job of communicating science to the general public. And today I am so excited because one of my favorite authors is on with us, and this is Marcus Chown. Marcus, you want to say hi? Hi. Hi, Joanne. <laughs> hi, Jeff. We, we're really glad you could join us. And so Marcus is, uh, he just reminded me, he's the author of 13 books. I know I haven't read all of them, and I, I've only read um, one of his little sort of science fiction books for kids. Uh, but uh, we're going to focus mainly on his new book, uh, which just came out beginning of the month, What a Wonderful World, One Man's Attempt to Explain the Big Stuff. And, uh, but most of Marcus's books have focused on uh, physics and cosmology. Uh, um, I remember one of the first books I picked up from the uh, bookstore, yes there are still bookstores, but there were more when I picked it up, called um, Quantum Theory Cannot Hurt You. <laughs> and I think I saw it advertised in uh, New Scientist, which is one, only one of many publications you write for. Um, and your books all have interesting titles like The Never-Ending Days of Being Dead and uh, uh, we need to talk about Kelvin. Uh, but we're, I'm going to let Jeff begin with questions because I have a lot of questions about that, how these titles are chosen and, and how you communicate. So I'm going to let Jeff start. Yeah, and I was very interested to read that you wrote We Need to Talk About Kelvin because as, you'll, as will become clear, I'm a physicist and Kelvin has a lot of meaning for me. But we'll get to that later, and I want to start with, with an essay question that has to do with our communication topic, sort of, and starts at the very beginning of the book, where in the foreword, you uh, thank your editor, Neil Belton, you said, for suggesting that the next book you write should be about everything, that you should write about everything. And that quickly put me in mind of that deer in the headlight look that sixth graders get when you ask them to write an essay on what I did during my summer vacation. And the question is, when you're setting out to write about everything, which is the way it seems to them, how do you go about that? Where do you start? What do you do? How do you find some place to hold on for the ride? Well, that's exactly the problem that I had. Uh, my editor, I've got a fantastic editor called Neil Belton, um, he actually writes novels himself. He wrote a novel about uh, Owen Schrodinger, actually, about his love life uh, during the war in, in, in Dublin. And uh, Neil said to me over lunch one day, the thing that you do is that you, you kind of communicate um, complex physics to anyone. Why don't you use that skill to, to communicate everything to anyone? And I was completely daunted. I thought, as you just said, where would you possibly start? And I put him off for about two years. And I wrote lots of outlines, uh, which I threw away, because I couldn't think, figure out how would you organize this material. But in the meantime, I, I, I was lucky enough to do an iPad app called Solar System for iPad. Mm -hmm. And uh, what actually happened there was we, I had to write 120 stories uh, on planets and moons and asteroids and all that kind of stuff in nine weeks. And so there was absolutely no, all you, all you could do was just jump in, write about things that you knew about, and while you were writing about them, think in the back of your head about what you should be doing next, what you should be researching next. So after putting Neil off for about two years, I thought, well, I'll just dive in. I'll start writing about some things that I know nothing about. So, of course, I rang Joanne to ask about cell biology because I don't know anything about cell biology. So if she, if she, if she critiques my book, she's critiquing herself because actually... <laughs> I really like that book. I picked her brains. I picked her brains. Um, did. But, we had a nice long conversation. Yes. So I thought I'd start off with things like money, which, you know, finance, which I didn't know anything about at mm -hmm. all. And I would ring economists and try and pick their, their brains and, and, and do things like the brain, uh, evolution, these kind of things. Um, I found it very, very hard, uh, but also exhilarating. You know, it was hard because when I do physics, I, I, I identify someone, I phone them up. And I've probably got a 95% chance that they will answer my questions, or at least have a go. With many of these other people, they were speaking a completely different language to me. And I'd often have to go to two, three, four people before I could find someone who could, uh, you know, who could talk, talk to me in a language I could understand, a toddler language. <laughs> well, uh, that's, um, 
where is it? So in the back of your book somewhere, you list all the people you contacted. And uh, I recognize a lot of the names because they are really good at uh, what they do. And um, so including, we've got Adam Rutherford and Carl Zimmer, Brian May, how fun is that? Simon mm -hmm. Singh, we, uh, Stuart Clark, uh, these are names I know. I, and I'm not reading all of them. I'm just reading ones that hopefully the audience yeah. will recognize. But definitely, I'm looking at this list going, oh, I know, oh, alum. You know, you've you've really contacted a lot of people to to uh, get. Ooh, Manjeet! Wow, I'm here reading uh, this. I'm all excited here. I'm I'm in good company. <laughs> yes, my name is there. I underline this because pick people like Ha Jun Chang, who is uh, an economist at Cambridge. He wrote, I think, 23 things they don't tell you about capitalism. Uh, yes. Paleoanthropologists, all kinds of people. But as you well, say, Brian May, in fact, did help me because he he did a PhD in astrophysics, and uh, I was talking to him about something, and he. Uh, about, about the electric force and so he in an email he gave me the title of one of my chapters which was um, my chapter on electricity now what was it called <laughs> I can't even remember uh, uh, you thank better goodness right opposites attract yeah so, so you know he did contribute something yeah yeah and sometimes people contribute you know they're encouraging and, and that's very helpful too but well, while you were talking about that moving on now from the forward to the introduction um, I, I wrote down this quotation. You said, I loved learning about all kinds of things I know nothing about. And I'm thinking about many people who really don't see it as an adventure to learn things they know nothing about. So I'm, I'm thinking, how can you persuade them that they should be learning about things they don't know about? Because it can be very exciting. It can. It can be very exciting. Uh, um, and it was, uh, but, but, but again, it takes some confidence to do that. I mean, uh, because I phone, you know, for, for new scientists, when I write for new scientists, I often phone like Nobel Prize winners, and I ask them what, what I think are stupid questions or basic questions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they hadn't even thought of those uh, questions. And, and so you begin to get confidence that, that you, you, know, you, you know, your stupid questions are actually in, in, mm -hmm. interesting. And I think most people are put off, you know. Um, in fact, the f fantastic thing is that kids are brilliant because kids have no fear. And they ask very basic, very fundamental questions. But then adults seem to get a bit worried that they're going to, act, they're going to be stupid. So uh, again, through being a journalist and through being a sales writer, I've, I've gained confidence that, that, that you know, these, if, if I've got a question, it's, it's, worth, um, you know, it's worth someone answering it. You know, uh, interestingly, I was, when I was at Caltech, I was a, I was a, a, a student at Caltech. I was taught by Richard Feynman, and mm -hmm. I do remember in, a, in a, uh, I, I did a course where he, he lectured for half of the lectures and he shared the lectures with a guy called Jerry Sussman from MIT and the whole point of these lectures was for Feynman to pick this guy's brains. So sometimes you'd find yourself sitting next to uh, a Feynman uh, in the audience and whereas the average student would ask maybe one or two questions and think I'm, I'm stupid, Feynman would ask 30 questions in quick succession and his, his, his idea was that if he did not understand it, the guy on the stage was not being clear. Mm -hmm. And I just realised, you know, uh, he had that confidence to ask what, 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 you know, they weren't really stupid questions, but to keep asking questions. And I think most adults give up and they think that they're stupid, but they're not. Well, do, do you agree with a lot have... of... I was going to say, I, go ahead, Jim. I was just going to say, do you agree then with, with many teachers who say that they, they feel like they don't really understand something until they have to explain it to someone? Is writing, Absolutely. Is writing about it the way that you you know, coalesce and, and synthesize what you're thinking about? Absolutely. I mean, it's the way I learn. In fact, it's the way Feynman learned, actually. I mean, I'm not, I'm not equating myself with Feynman in any way, but his criterion of whether he understood anything mm -hmm. was whether he could actually explain it to a gardener at, on the Caltech campus. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, that is my criterion of understanding things. I mean, I learned physics when I was at university, and it was all mathematics. But since then, I've been re trying to really understand it. In vis I'm very visual, so I have to think in, in visual terms. Mm -hmm. And really, my, my criterion of whether I can understand it is, is whether I can actually explain it to someone sitting next to me on a number 25 bus, or as I say in my book, someone unfortunate enough to be sitting next to me on a number 25 bus. So it seems that the, that the process by which I really get to understand things is exactly the same process as actually writing popular science books. So I'm fortunate in those two things overlap. I'm trying to figure things out for myself in my book. I don't really have any readers in mind at all, only me, but, but fortunately it does overlap, so it's mm -hmm. good. Mm-hmm. That's very convenient, isn't it? <laughs> very convenient, yes. 
So um, I was. <clears throat> so you mentioned about going to Caltech. So I was going to ask about your background. You know, because sometimes we have people who um, they they became a journalist. They be, they are an English major, and, but they found that science is very interesting. But really, you're a scientist who then found you were good at writing, or why didn't you tell us about that journey? Well, it's, it's, it's the other way around, really. I mean, or, or it's, or it's not, not as simple as that. I mean, when I was at, at uh, high school, I mean, uh, when, you know, I, I really liked English. You know, I really liked writing imaginative things, and I liked science. But in English schools, they would not let you do both. So you mm. could not do arts and sciences. I don't know if that's the case now, but they wouldn't. So I had to do physics. Um, and I went to university in England in physics. I went to Caltech to do to do radio astronomy, uh, but I always wrote. I wrote short stories and things like that. And then when I was in America, I suddenly thought um, I, I don't really like this. What I was doing, I was doing very long baseline interferometry, which is big science that involves using radio dishes in Europe and America, and you know, getting to look at the same object, and it involves lots of people, and and it was. You know, and, and it's not, there was not much an individual could do. And I, I started writing, I wrote to newspapers in England and said, can you give me a job? And, and for, very, very fortunately, by a series of uh, pieces of luck, I got to work on New Scientist. I was on the editorial staff of New Scientist, and I got to write books. But I'm, I'm very risk averse, so I'm kind of, I, I, I went from New Scientist to writing popular science books. But I never, ever in my life intended to write popular science books. I wanted to write fiction. Uh, but so I'm gradually getting back to what I like doing. So. Yeah, I like both, really. I don't see why you can't be interested in lots of things. You know, why you have to be pigeonholed as a physicist or or, 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 a, or a novelist or whatever. You know, it seems a bit of a shame to me. Don't you think it's fair to say, Joanne, that we obviously agree with that since that's what we're talking about? <laughs> that's right. Uh, okay, so I'm looking here at this list, your bibliography that's listed on uh, Wikipedia. So. We have, you have such uh, clever titles that are eye-catching. Afterglow of Creation, From the Fireball to the Discovery of Comet, Cosmic Ripples. They claim that, is that really your first one then? That was my first popular science book, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, it, bizarrely, I actually wrote it for the same editor I have now at, at my publisher, Faber. Faber is a really old, yeah, very old-fashioned publisher. Uh, um, it's the last major independent publisher in Britain, and one of its founders was the American poet T. S. Eliot, who who had an office there, you know, uh, and and it's quite uh, so it's, it's it's quite an interesting. Uh, but 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 my editor Neil Belton, I pursued him. I'm his stalker. Uh, uh, when I originally wanted to write a book, it was about this cosmic ripple story, which was in all in the newspapers, and I wrote to publishers and I said I'd like to write about this, and they all rejected me, except this one person, Neil Belter. And he's a brilliant editor, and, and I pursued him from publisher to publisher. As I say, I, I am his stalker. <laughs> You're going after him. But, so. but it's very, very interesting what you say about titles, because I, I, I really spent ages and ages and ages trying to find the titles. Mm -hmm. I looked through song, song lyrics, I looked through poetry most of all, because I think you get really good titles in poetry. And I have endless fights with publishers to get my titles on the books rather than often a very bland title and, and, and it's cool. very very difficult because as an author you're on your own and you very often come to the point where the publisher says well all of us here like this yeah. you know in other words you're outvoted um, <laughs> but, but I feel as I've got a real experience with, with titles and I know which ones work so for instance the universe next door is a, a, a line from an E. Cummings poem and, uh, it's, and probably it's my best title because a good title um, tells you what the book is about, but it also juxtaposes two things which you know, mm -hmm. which which are not normally together, and they're so intrigued. So you put the universe and next door, you know, uh, the the cosmic and the mundane together, and and that book sold ten times better than the previous one, which didn't have a good title. It's called The Magic mm -hmm. Furnace. So I do, I, I I think titles are incredibly important. We need to talk about Kelvin. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, my book doesn't it, it has one sentence about Kelvin in it. <laughs> but I, just, I, I was walking down some stairs one day, and I, I, I and I actually um, it just popped into my head, and I thought, oh, that's amusing. Later, I went to a talk by Lionel Shriver at the Cheltenham Literature Festival because Lionel Shriver is an American writer, but she lives in London. Uh, yeah. But I was too shy to go and ask her to write a foreword to my book, you know, because she wrote. We need to talk about Kevin, of course. Yes, yes. So, so I think now you can correct me if you know anything about this, but I think we need to talk about Kevin. 
was more popular in the UK than in the US, if, if I understand that correctly. But I, I could be wrong. Um, I think but, you're right. So, because, yeah. So you, did you have to, here's the thing, it strikes me some of your books you have to change your title when you go to publish them in the U.S. Like, a U.S. Yes, and, 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 and because publishers are on the whole, I mean, you know, I hope, well, obviously my publisher is going to maybe watch this, but publishers are pretty bad at titles. <laughs> uh, they really are. Uh, and so if a publisher imposes a title on your book, it almost certainly will not sell. Yeah. And so the titles which have been imposed on my book in America, in America have made sure those books didn't sell. So, for instance, no. Quantum Theory Cannot Hurt You got called the Quantum Zoo. I, mean, I would have predicted, right. I would have predicted right. that that wouldn't sell. Um, Quantum Theory Cannot Hurt You is, in fact, actually a truncation of, of another line of poetry from uh, Adrian Henry, who is a British poet. Uh, and he, he wrote a, a book called Mashed Potatoes, Cannot Hurt You, Darling. He wrote a, a, a poem. So it's supposed to be quantum theory kind of hurt you, darling, but the publisher cut off the darling on the end. So, so I have these endless fights anyway. I have these endless fights about, about, about uh, titles. But yeah, yeah, get the wrong title and your book is dead. Uh, and, so that's um, right. That, I bought it under the quantum zoo. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, publishers so, tend to be about as conservative as bankers, don't they? So quantum, you know, the, we need to talk about Kelvin. Uh, my publisher was very, they were, they were not sure about that at all, uh, and they said they weren't, you know, but they, they went with it in the end. But I had more reaction from readers for that title than any other title. Uh, mm -hmm. so, Interesting. Yeah. So do you want to hear how different, Jeff, you want to hear how different the U.S. title for that one is? Because I knew they had to change it. Um, they published, uh, we need to talk about Kelvin yeah. in the U.S. as the matchbox that ate a 40-ton truck. Now I would have predicted that that would kill the book, and it, and it did. It did. Yeah. I would have predicted that ahead of time. See, the, the bizarre thing that you just pointed out, Joanne, is that we need to talk about Kelvin. Is is about American uh, high school shootings, written by an American novelist, uh, and yet the American yeah. publisher decides to use a different title from the pun that's used in England, which is bizarre. Really, I would have thought that. But there we are. It's a peculiar well, I, thing. I'll agree that the, the, the matchbox, et cetera, is not, well, it's a bit unwieldy as a title. Yes. But I'm, now I'm a little bit disappointed to find out, you know, I could have gone out of my way to find a copy of Let's Talk About, We Need to Talk About Kelvin, except now I find out there's only one sentence about <laughs> Kelvin in it. This is a big disappointment. Well, as I, actually, I think there's a bit more than one sentence. I'm exaggerating. But as I say, the, the ideal uh, title does two things. It tells you about the book, so you're in no doubt. You don't need to read a subtitle. It tells you about the book, but it also uh, intrigues you in some way. Mm -hmm. So with that title, it doesn't tell you about the book, but it intrigues you in some way, or it makes you laugh, or whatever. So yeah. that's only half. You know, so it's, it's so difficult to get the complete thing. I'm thinking of titles like The Selfish Gene, brilliant. The Naked Ape, you know, fantastic. Uh, Clockwork Orange, you know, these are all fantastic titles, uh, but they are so so hard to get. They really are, you know. And I, as I say, I waste, my wife gets really fed up because we waste whole holidays going through, uh, our whole vacations going through books of poetry and things like that looking for titles. Titles are exceedingly hard and I, I write short stories too and it's so rare but occasionally a good title presents itself and you know, you usually know this is yes. a good title when you finally get it and most of the time the stories are like, well, I start out and I say, this is the working title, and I just can never think of anything better, but it's horrible. It's just, I mean, it, a, a good title grabs you by the throat, it does. Yeah, this yeah. current book, uh, this was a really, this is very sad, because I, I thought, I was trying to think of titles for the whole time I was writing it, and I didn't, I wasn't able to come up with a good title. So really, I was in this incredibly stressful situation where I was in an office, with a whole bunch of people from Favour, they're extremely nice people, by the way, but it's a stressful situation when this book that you put all this effort into, you know... Yeah, they're, they're, look at the size of this. They're gonna, it's got very big print and lots of white space. So, so you know, we had an hour of brainstorming, and, you know, and, and I, had a, I thought, oh, no, you know, is, is I going to get something terrible imposed on my book? But actually, it's okay. I wouldn't say it's brilliant, but it's okay. It's, I, think, I think it's a pretty... Uh, it's, it's sort of like not... Not brilliantly colored title, but it's a it's a sound title. I think it it has a nice evocative quality to it, and it it leads to something that I wanted to to talk about too. Particularly since we've mentioned Feynman, 
Um, I have another quotation just to prove that I've read at least as far as page 282. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm I've come very close, and sometimes I have to admit that I'm you know I've only made it halfway through, but I am halfway through the the chapter on cosmology, so I'm nearly at the end. But don't tell me how it turns out. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, you wrote that the world around us looks bewilderingly complex, but this is an illusion according to Democritus. You're talking about atoms there, and we could do that. But when I was reading that, I realized that I didn't find that a particularly startling thing for you to say. But it could be, and there were many things in the book that didn't startle me, probably because many of them I've heard since I was young, and also because of all my educational time as a physicist. But now, some people think that a physicist's outlook on the universe must be something cold and impoverished because they would claim we've taken all the poetry and mystery out of things and because we understand stuff. And I want to invoke Richard Feynman's name and say there's a, there's a footnote in the Feynman lecture someplace that I've always adored where he says, you know, that is the silliest thing to say. Uh, I see more than other people. Does that really give me an impoverished view? I want to know uh, how you look at the universe now that you've gotten to the end of this book and learned about all these things. <laughs> Is it more interesting, or have you taken all the mystery and poetry out of it? It's always more interesting. It, it really is. Uh, you know, uh, I, as I say, I, I didn't know anything about cell biology. I didn't know anything really about how the brain is wired up. Uh, uh, you know, it's exhilarating to find out um, about new areas, really, and to find things that kind of, you know, blow your mind. I mean, I, I, I found out lots of weird things. For instance, I found out that, 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 that possibly the, the crucial advantage that humans had over Neanderthals was sewing. You know, mm -hmm. this, is, this was seriously told me by um, Chris Stringer, who's a professor of paleoanthropology at the Natural History mm -hmm. Museum in London. And, and uh, it could, we've never found, we've never found a bone Neanderthal needle, but lots of human needles have been found. And so the idea is that the crucial, you know, the, the crucial advantage that we had was that humans could, could actually sew baby clothes. And so there was a, maybe a 1% uh, be better chance of survival for human babies compared to Neanderthal babies during the Ice Age winters. So, you know, all these things. Yeah. The, other thing, the other thing that really amazed me was that there was no change in the design of hand axes for 1.4 million years. Now, I know that next year the iPhone will be probably different to, to this year. And actually, this, this idea that things change has been true pretty much since the end of the last ice age, you know, since we developed farming, food production, and that allowed mm -hmm. people to come together in big cities and interact and change, exchange ideas and all that kind of stuff. But what we don't realize is that this 13,000 years since the last ice age is really not typical of, of the rest of the, of the human history. And, and really, things did not change for vast... I mean, 1.4 million years, 60,000 generations, and nobody thought I could improve that, that hand axe. It's very interesting, but, but what it's probably telling us is that, first of all, it was, it was, it was okay, it wasn't broken, so they, they kept it. But, uh, it, you know, people lived in very, very small bands, maybe 50, you know, maximum yeah. of 100. And, and so, um, you know, maybe things were invented many, many, many times, and they were lost when people died. It's only when you get farming and you get the, 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 the you know, the, you're able to support large numbers of people that innovations and ideas and inventions um, perpetuate, you know. So, uh, so you know, people, invent, fire may, you know, may have been tamed dozens of times and lost. Uh, throughout human history, so I don't know. It just struck me that, that uh, of course, the other thing, of course, is that, that that people may have actually had bone tools, or they may have had wooden tools, and they've decayed. But but I don't know. I, uh, every now and then, these these little nuggets that you you learn, and they kind of uh, you know they do illuminate your your world. So yeah, I haven't done everything, by the way. I mean, I certainly haven't. I mean, my book isn't about everything. I mean, it, it's supposed to be about everything, but it's really a book about everything. Volume one. Well, you explain so, the big stuff, so now you can go the on big to stuff. the, the mid-size. <laughs> interestingly, <laughs> Jeff just mentioned cosmology, the cosmology chapter he's got to. And interestingly, when my editor read that, he said, this is, this is garbage, Marcus. This is, this is garbage. <laughs> and, I, like, and, I, and I thought, oh my God, you know, what have I done? Have I, have I written this really badly or something? No, he was actually saying the cosmology is garbage. And of course, <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, um, and, and maybe cosmologists uh, don't, 
quite realise this because they don't see it from outside. But but really, we've based our edifice, uh, our Big Bang model, on the basis of the basic two percent of, of, of the matter that we can see in the universe, mm -hmm. and and the major components we now realise are I think it's about seventy three percent dark energy, which is something we don't we don't really know what it is. Twenty three percent dark matter, and of the four percent that is made of atoms, like you and me, we've only ever seen half of it. And and when you when you read all this, when an outsider reads it, they think it's absolutely ridiculous. And <laughs> and, and so it's quite interesting to to, to get. And, and I would have thought that 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 was something that I knew more about than anything else. But my editor thought it was total garbage. Right. It becomes pretty amazing that we can know anything at all, given our our place in the universe. Sometimes. So uh, yeah. Yes. Well, is that a question? Well, it does. It does. I mean, you know, look, look. I mean, it's un unbelievable that we've got this picture of the, u the universe. I mean, uh, we, 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 as you say, we're, we're pinned to this tiny little ball of rock in a, in a cosmic backwater. Uh, we can't go anywhere and see anything, and the only thing we can do is, is we can pick up the light from from objects out in the universe, and we've constructed this incredible picture. Not only can we see, do we know the extent and content of the universe? I mean, we can see to the edge, to the the horizon. We can count up the, 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 the building blocks. There are about 100 billion galaxies like our Milky Way. Not only do we know the, the extent and content, but we've got a pretty good idea that it all came into being about 13.82 billion years ago in an explosion called the Big Bang. Uh, it's hot and dense, and, and out of the cooling debris, there formed the galaxies. This is like a Milky Way. This is the kind of picture that previous generations would have killed to have. You know, we have this amazing, amazing picture. And it allows us to ask even more profound questions like what was the Big Bang? What happened before the Big Bang? What drove the Big Bang? This kind of stuff. So I think we're amazingly fortunate to be alive at this instant in time. I think it all maybe just underscores the fact that scientists, uh, when you get down to it, are really storytellers, aren't they? Absolutely. I mean, it's a, but obviously it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a story which is, which is distinct from the creation myth in that we believe mm -hmm. we actually have some evidence for it. Mm -hmm. But, but it is a, a fantastic creation myth. And what, I, one of the reasons why I called the book, or I was happy with, about calling the book, what a wonderful world, is that I began to appreciate what an unbelievably uh, amazing world and universe we live in. Something so amazing that we could not possibly have invented it. You know. It, uh, if you take quantum theory, for instance, which is our theory of uh, atoms, the building blocks of all matter, uh, it's stranger than science fiction. You know, it, it gives us a window into an Alice in Wonderland world beneath the skin of reality, you know, where, where a single atom can be in two places at once, you know, the, the equivalent of me being here and where you are, which I believe is east coast of America, I'm in London. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, we could not have invented this stuff. So uh, I do think that if kids really knew about all this stuff, like quantum theory, um, they would really, really switch them on to, to science at a very early age because it would blow their minds. So what, what kind of audience would you say you are reaching to? Because I could see like a high schooler or a middle schooler really appreciating your books mm. quite a bit. It, you know, in addition to adults who are just looking for, you know, a, a fun read. Uh, because you have a really you have a really clear voice, and there's no doubt, and it's just really clear. Like you're like, hey, I'm having fun. I'm going to take your hand. We're going to go. You know, let's look at this, and I'll and I'll just be talking to you as we're we're doing this. You know, that's the sense I get. It's very friendly, a very friendly, very clear voice. Um, thank you'd you. Make an, you'd make an excellent teacher, a science teacher. I have to say. Oh, thank you, thank you. But I mean, I I, I try and. I, even in my book, Quantum Theory Cannot Hurt You, I was actually saying in the title, you know, please don't be afraid. You know, this stuff isn't scary. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, be, be like a kid and don't be, don't be, don't be scared. Um, but who's it? Who's it aimed at? Again, it's really aimed at me. You know, I was just trying to understand things myself. Um, but but uh, I really write for my wife Karen. She's a nurse in London. Uh, she doesn't really have a science background. She has a medical background, but she doesn't obviously have a physics background. So I kind of write for her. And when she, you know, reaches for the remote control and switches on the TV, I know that I'm boring and I've got to write it in a better way. But but I'm constantly. I'm constantly surprised though. I, 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 had, I went to the Edinburgh Science Festival uh, in April, this, this fantastic place in Edinburgh, and the festival is always fun. And I gave a, an hour talk on quantum theory for, for adults. And what really, really surprised me was that afterwards, I would say half of the people uh, lining up to talk to me afterwards were 11 or under. 
And mm -hmm. I was just absolutely amazed because I thought, well, this book is not aimed at them at all. But again, they have no fear, you know. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 their parents were very fearful, you know. Uh, but, but, but all these kids that I didn't think I'd aimed my book at uh, at all were, were really interested. While you're there, what, what kills that sense of uh, wonder and the lack of fear in young people? And we, you know, we, we often observe that they're more creative and inventive. And where, do, where does that go? I don't know. I mean, it could be the education system, but I don't really want to hammer teachers, really. But I mean, when, when I was at school, for instance, I never really had any good, I didn't have a good physics teacher at all. Um, and, and all of my interest came from uh, when, when I was about eight, my dad bought me a book on astronomy. I've got absolutely no idea why. My parents left school when they were 15, they had no qualifications, but they knew the importance of education and books. And would you believe my phone is ringing? But no, it'll stop in a minute. <laughs> this is, this okay. is live. Actually, I, I should tell you that when, when my book came out, the first day I went on this radio program, which was a, a global uh, a station. It was broadcast in Brazil and everywhere. And, and uh, a paramedic, an ambulance driver in Britain, phoned me up to congratulate me on, me on my book live on, on the actual program. They were very amused by it. I forgot to switch my mobile phone off. <laughs> what, where was I? What was you? What were you asking? Well, do you do you think that the the lack of fear and the the sense hmm. of adventure in kids is is actively killed or not nurtured or I, you know I'm wondering where does it go? Is it peer pressure and adolescence and puberty and all that that just makes? I'm not, I'm not so sure. I think Joanne would probably know more about that than me because she's got four children. So <laughs> I, I don't I don't know. Uh, but. But certainly I found that the school system wasn't wasn't too brilliant and it was only like reading science fiction and things outside of school that kept mm. me really really interested. A lot of the interesting science that I ever learned was in a, were in Arthur C. Clarke novels, you know. <laughs> um, and, and so unfortunately most most kids in my class didn't actually ever get switched on, you know. One of the big problems with um, uh, science teaching is it's in the pre-Harry Potter era, particularly I think in, in Britain. I hope I'm not going to really annoy lots of teachers who have phoned me up and so I'm really being bad to them. But, but if you, if you uh, when I was at school, uh, um, when I was nine, I had to read Nicholas Nickleby by, by Charles Dickens. Now that put me off reading Dickens for the next 20 years, you know. Uh, nowadays, of course, children read something like Harry Potter or, or, or you know, or, I don't know, uh, or, or vampire books or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and it kind of really, really switches on their interest in reading. And then later, you know, when they've been switched on, they'll, they'll come to the classics. But science still seems to teach like chronologically, you know, and you learn you learn Newton's laws and you learn gas laws and all sort of stuff, and, and you don't even get to the interesting stuff by the time you actually are finished. Uh, it's so pretty, it's so, pretty horrid, really. Hmm? It's pretty horrid the way we teach physics, I. <laughs> yeah, and, and bizarrely, uh, you know, my book Quantum Theory Cannot Hurt You. I got lots of letters from teachers, and they said, you know, we need we need to be teaching this in schools, and I think. Give the kids the weird quantum theory. They don't care if they don't understand it all. Uh, you know, we, unfortunately, an adult starts reading a book, and the minute they they can't understand something, they think, "Well, I ought to understand it. So I'm stupid," and they give up. The kid's mm -hmm. quite happy to read it, only understanding ten percent of it. Uh, it's not not worried at all. Uh, so I think quantum theory. They don't need to know all all the details of it, but I think that would be the equivalent of Harry Potter, you know. And then they would maybe be more interested later because so often. I talked to people, adults, and they said, I didn't learn any of this at school. If I'd known this at school, I would have been interested. I mean, for instance, I wrote a book called The Magic Furnace, uh, which is about the origin of the elements in your body and, uh, you know, how they were built inside stars and the Big Bang. I got a letter from a, the wife of a London cab driver who said she'd been brought to tears by the end of chapter two of my book. I mean, I hope it wasn't the thought of having to read chapter three. <laughs> but, anyway, <laughs> but anyway, she... Uh, she had left school at 15 uh, with no qualifications. She had three children. She was in her 40s. Uh, and she was inspired by my book to get herself educated. She went to university and everything. She did was very successful. And, and she hadn't realized that, that science was interesting. And I think there's so many people like that who just don't realize. And, and, and it's so wonderful when you write a popular science book and you switch someone on. You know, I mean, I go to... To, to my I've gone to my old uh, university, University of London, and, and I've met people who said, "Well, I only came here because I read your books." And I just think, how fantastic! Because in my turn, I obviously was switched on by people like uh, R.C. Clarke 
and Carl Sagan. I should tell you that one of the first things that I ever did as a journalist, I came to London, back to London from California, and I was sent to interview Carl Sagan at Whoa. the, uh, uh, where, where was it? It was the Dorchester Hotel, which is in Park Lane in the middle of London, and it's probably one of the most exclusive hotels. He had a whole suite, and, uh, and I went there, and I was so nervous because he was my hero that I just babbled and just, just like told him about myself rather than asking him anything. And I, even now, when I think about it, I, I just go, you know, I, oh, I feel so embarrassed. And I never actually wrote anything about him because I hadn't written enough down to write an article. And I simply <laughs> went back to the magazine and never mentioned my interview with Carl Sagan. About 20 years later, I was asked to, to, to write some introduction to some special that New Scientist magazine did on science fiction. And uh, I, I did mention, I remembered one thing that, that, that Sagan had actually said, which was that he did science because science was stranger than science fiction. So I just quoted that. And his son got in touch and said how pleased he was to read that. <laughs> So actually, my, my <laughs> terrible, terrible interview with Richard Fine, uh, Richard Fine, with, with uh, Carl Sagan all those years ago, I did actually get to use it eventually. That's, that's it's when you're uh, it's terrible trying to meet your heroes. It's terrible. We do have, we had another guest on who met David Attenborough and apparently yeah. <laughs> made quite the scene uh, <laughs> when she did that. So speaking of kids, I'd like to just uh, veer off it a little. It's not like you've written a lot of these, but you did write this children's book called Felicity, Frobisher, and the Three-Headed Aldebaran Dust Devil. That's a mouthful. Aldebaran. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's probably, no, you know, I'm sorry. I also, don't, <laughs> I also don't say vitamin on a regular basis. I've written so, five, uh, by the way. I've written five. Yeah, okay, okay, that's and great. I, it, it kind of has taken me over, really, and she's become a real person, and, and the books <laughs> write themselves, and I've enjoyed writing them more than anything else. But... I wrote that book for, for Faber and uh, the uh, combination of things, but the, the, the editor, the children's editor, went on a sabbatical and when she came back, I said, well, I'd like to write some more um, and she said, well, it's too big a gap. So yeah. none of the others have been published. I, I ought to say, I can't blame Faber entirely because initially when I, when I wrote the first one, they said, oh, can you write, can you write two more uh, in the next eight weeks? <laughs> and, I, and I thought, well, God, I hadn't even thought of writing another one, and how can I write two more in eight weeks? But I really should have said yes, uh, and I didn't. <laughs> and, and so, of course, the only children's books that are successful tend to be like a series, because you know, a single book gets lost on the bookshelf in the bookstore, uh, and, and I kind of missed my opportunity, and, and they didn't want to publish any more. But, but, my, but the, other, the other four that I've written are far better than the first one, and I'd really love to get them published. But anyway. So actually, summarize this quickly. I mean, I, I enjoyed it. I only, my kids were getting older. <laughs> only one of them read it, and you know, the others were like, eh. <laughs> for 80-year-olds. It's for 80-year-olds. It's, it's, it's got yeah. lots of stuff in there for adults as well. But, right, but, well... But, I mean, basically, I mean, basically, it's it's a, it's a story about having a really, really bad friend. Really, I mean, it does. Con wormholes are a plot feature, and I, because I did think to myself, what can I put in a children's book that maybe other other uh, writers couldn't? And I thought, well, I know a bit of physics, so I will have wormholes in there, you know, shortcuts through space time. So they're plot elements. But basically, it's about having a very, very bad friend, and it's also biographical. Felicity Fraser is me. Um, I, I had a terrible, terrible friend when I was at school. I was incredibly good and polite. Never got into trouble with any teachers, and I had this appalling friend who used to get me doing all kinds of things I would never normally do. Uh, he actually lives in California. He doesn't even know that that book is based on him. <laughs> and the, the, the very bad character, which is Flump, the three-headed old Deborah Dust Devil, is him. But actually, it's just, so, so she, I mean, Felicity is me. I was boring and dull. I never did, I just wanted to have a quiet life. Uh, and then there's this terrible friend that, that you know got me into trouble all the time. So that's really the plot. That's interesting because I thought maybe you had uh, some grandkids or something that you know, you know, you aimed it towards or nieces or nephews or something. That's interesting though to, to hear that it's autobiographical. Um, the funny thing is, I went to some schools and uh, and and I read bits of it and talked to them. The kids were really really liked it actually. Uh, and I had a better reaction for that than any of my other books actually. So it's yeah. a shame that I can't get the rest of them. Published, but but um, interestingly, I did say to children, "Who do you think Felicity Frobisher is?" 
and not a single child was ever able to guess. I don't really think they ever have the idea that an author puts himself into a book at all. You know, well, I don't know. That, that you know, a, a gentleman is now a young, you know, eight-year-old girl. Yes. You know, Maybe they're, that's they're too probably, much to think. <laughs> they just can't quite go there. If it was a little boy, maybe it'd go. I don't, I don't know. You, so you just. I do write in a rather peculiar way. It makes my, my wife laugh because uh, the, the titles <laughs> are, are, are all very similar of the book. So I'll, I'll start writing a, a Felicity Frobisher book. Um, and I mean, for instance, the next one is called Felicity Frobisher and a Newly Wedded Capellan Toast Weevil. <laughs> and uh, there was no Toast Weevil in it. But because I got the title, I had to have a character as a, as, as a, a you know, a, in it. And I, I wrote a book where Felicity Frobisher accidentally, accidentally wipes out the dinosaurs called... Felicity Frobisher and the ever so bitey mouse like shrew like thing. There was no mouse like shrew like thing in the book. Okay. So I had to kind of re jig it. So, so I don't think, I think most authors, they write a book, they don't ever then have to rewrite it because of their title. So maybe that's an unusual way I write it. It's fun. It's fun. I've really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And I got a better reaction, as I say, than anything else I've, I've done. Um, well, I, I like your other books too, but this this was a delight. And of course, like I said, I, well, and as you know, I have kids, and I will say, and this pops up as often as I can say, my kids, my oldest is uh, a graduate student in atmospheric sciences now. My second child is a sophomore in physics right now. I don't know about the next two, but I I thank the physics teacher at the high school. He has inspired more kids to head towards engineering and physics than I know. And, you know, that the, the power of a fantastic teacher Absolutely. just I mean, goes yeah. beyond. Even, you know, yeah, mm. you got mom here, but I'm not a physicist. I'm a biologist, and I, I know enough physics that I need yeah. to. But I don't, I don't get a kick from six pages of equations, and my kids... They do. I think they find it <laughs> soothing or something. Uh, Jeff might too. <laughs> yes, I talked about. I, talk, I talked about you know not getting inspired by science when I was at school. But I ought to say, as you just said, that there are so many teachers out there that absolutely do inspire our kids. And I had a, a, an inspirational English teacher, you know, who who basically gave me positive reinforcement for my essay. So I quite like writing, you know, as you do. So yeah, I mean the power that you can have as a teacher is is incredible, because you can completely change people's lives, can't you? So right. it's, a, it's a fantastic. Yeah. But you do you bring to mind one thing, I, a hypothesis I might start to work on for now is that like an enthusiastic, vigorous teacher makes all the difference. But I'm not sure that it's the teacher's transmission of facts about the subject that's as important as the teacher's enthusiasm and obvious interest in something that enlivens the listener and and somehow says this is attractive and interesting I think it's like it's again you know if, if you've got a parent and they react to you in a positive way about something they say well that's you know that's a really nice drawing that you've done you're probably going to continue drawing because you want that approval from a parent and I think it's very similar with teachers I mean I remember mm -hmm. that my English teacher said something uh, uh, on, on one of my essays and said I've rarely seen such, I don't know, such insightful, I don't know, discussion of characters or something. And, and I don't, I'm not saying it to show off, but that, that kind of thing really made me think, wow, you know, I'm doing something okay. You know, I should continue doing this because I want this teacher's approval. You know, so maybe that's, it's just that, isn't it, really? You know, you get that posit it's, positive it's feedback. It's a very personal sort of thing in a way, more than some particular clarity about explanations as such. I think that that may be at the root of that, and nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. But and now that you've mentioned uh, approvals and things, I have two things I made notes of that I wanted to thank you for doing in this book, and so I'm going to do that now. One is um, on page six, and this will be no surprise to Joanne, but you wrote there is no life, as far as we know, except cellular life. Oh, uh, that, yes. That was something that startled me. I mean, I knew that, but I don't think I'd ever heard it put quite like that, and it seemed like, up, you know, the blinding revelation that says, by golly, that's what it is. That's, mm -hmm. that's what all of life that we know has this yes. cellular thing going on. And, of course, Joanne, I've seen all those things talking about cell, is, you know, the importance of the cell. 
but I never heard quite that connection. So that's number one. Uh, number two is a physicist thing, and this happened on page 258, and I wanted to thank you for mentioning invariance and for actually using the word invariance because it's a huge idea, as, as you and I know, among physicists that is virtually unknown to anyone who is not a physicist. And so something about that needs to be known a little bit sooner or later, I think. So you, think, you know, we, we write the laws of physics so that they are not dependent on any particular point of view. So they are completely general. So they're invariant with respect to all kinds of different transformations, don't we? We try and get the most yeah. general laws we possibly. But one of the things that really amazed me was that the laws of physics that we have are exactly the same laws of physics we would have if the universe was a void. Right. Isn't it interesting? Yep. So, for instance, things like the, the law of conservation of energy, uh, it, it comes from the fact that you can, if you do an experiment today and you do it tomorrow, you get the same result. So it's, it's called, called translate, time translational symmetry. Uh, all, pretty much all, the, that big, all the, the laws of physics are based on some kind of symmetry, something that you do uh, that, that, that doesn't change something else. Um, and the term, all the laws, so, uh, and including the laws of uh, quantum theory, which are obviously about nothing in, in an abstract space. But, but all of these laws would exist if the universe had nothing in it. So the laws of physics we have are the same laws of a void. And, and isn't, one that, of very, the, isn't that interesting? One of the big and very daring ideas about Newton's universal law of gravitation is the idea that it's universal, that it is the same everywhere, is a huge idea. That's an unbelievably powerful idea. I mean, because remember that at that time, people thought that there was the Earth, you know, made of four elements, and there was a fifth, fifth essence, you know, the, 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 the heavens. Uh, to, to actually unite those two, that was an incredible thing, and also an incredibly brave thing to do, you know, because obviously you are, you are, you are, uh, you know, you're violating, well, you're, you're, you're treading on the religious preserve. Uh, yeah. but, but to say, but also to say that there is a law that applies at all times and in all places, isn't that absolutely incredible? And 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 that kind of universal law that that, that has been a powerful idea in physics ever since, because we we'll continually look for universal laws, ones that apply at all in all places and at all times. And interestingly, that is the faith behind science, behind physics, the, the thing that's never acknowledged. We believe that there are universal laws and that they are simple. And mm -hmm. we have really no real reason, apart from an act of faith, to, to, mm -hmm. to believe that. Apart from the fact that when we do look for them, we do find these laws and, and, and they have you know, practical applications. But we're driven by this idea that the universe, the, you know, are these simple universal laws, and we don't have any real basis for for believing that, mm -hmm. other than it has gave, given us mastery over the world around us. It's an exceedingly bold idea, but it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, so but and, we don't and know why. That, why it's true. Hmm? Isn't that how that you know, like these theories come about and go? Well, you know, when I look at this and I look at this again mm -hmm. and again and ponder and think and equate and do all these things. There's something that should be here, and I'm pretty sure we can find it. And isn't that how a lot of this, the, these uh, subatomic particle discoveries are happening? It's like you know, they just yeah. they go knowing well, the universe can be explained. And I'm looking at all the other factors. There's something here, so we should go find it. And it you was know? one of those symmetries, you know. Obviously, in the news is the Higgs discovery, Higgs particle, predicted by Peter Higgs and four other physicists, although only two of them have got the Nobel Prize, so the other three will be probably pretty annoyed. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, it was symmetry that, 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 that really impressed um, Higgs. And what, what you're just saying is, is amazing, the incredible power of science. This, this man, Peter Higgs, was hiking in the Cairngorm Mountains of Scotland. I mean, you know, you call them hills, but we call them mountains, <laughs> in about 1965. And it occurred to him that there, there must exist this Particle, this 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 um, um, kind of knot in in this this invisible field that fills all the space and that gives gives all the other particles mass. So he, he has this idea while while hiking in the Cairngorms, and then 50 years later, uh, the most complex and most expensive experiment ever built at uh, the Large Hadron Collider finds it. I mean, what an unbelievable triumph for, for <laughs> science, don't you think? I mean, it's absolutely yeah. incredible. It, it is remarkable. 
I want to. Oh, wait, Peter, add... sorry, Peter, Peter Higgs does, famously does not have a phone, a television, yep. or a computer. Sorry, just like mention that. Good. Yeah, yeah that, that, <laughs> uh, I, I like to <laughs> hear that actually every once in a while, even though I can't live without my computer and phone. And I believe he I, moved I, out of particle physics because he couldn't understand it. It mm -hmm. got too complicated for him, so he moved into computer science. So isn't it amazing, you know, that he he just couldn't understand the consequences of his own. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, Joanne, I interrupted speaking. you. Sorry. No, that's okay. I, actually, I like that story. So uh, I, I want to have a compliment, and then I do want to ask about what you are reading or what you like to read and things like this. But first of all, when I sat there and spoke with you, you were querying me about cell biology and things like that. Well... I was amazed because you must have done some pre-research because you asked me questions that were stumping me and I'd be like, let me double check and get back to you on that. You know, because some of this, as, as it goes, sometimes you're, you're in a field, you study, you know, they make you study a broad swath and then you start to narrow it down. And I found it was like, oh, you know, this is actually challenging something maybe I learned early on. So I, I just have to say uh, uh, congratulations to you for, you know, really doing your research, doing your homework and, you know, and, and, and asking really great questions. And, and I'm very proud and I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. But you, you could ask me questions. Hmm? You can ask me questions that would stump me about physics. If you were just, you know, you could really. I mean, you know, if you ask me what is mass, what is time, oh. I would have, I would have great difficulty answering these questions. You know, in the same way that I asked you simple questions. So, really, right, I, I that think we so. don't have the answers to it. Yeah, yes. I love when. Uh, you know, and, and, and actually, the hardest questions I have to answer come from engineers who are going, well, exactly, how does that happen? And we're like, we don't know yet. You know, uh, yeah, but anyway, the. the so I'd like to move on, and we've got a few minutes left, to, to ask, you know, what do you like to read? What are you reading that you like or, you know, that you think, wow, everybody in the world should probably read this book or this book set me on my path or anything. Just... I, read a, I read a lot of fiction. I'm reading, a, this is a book I'm reading at the moment, which I'm finding very, very good. It's got a fantastic title. I don't know if you can read it. Can you read the it? People of Forever Are Not Afraid. Uh -huh. It's by an Israeli uh, woman who's only about, I think it's about 23, and she writes about about being in the army. In, in, I've done only a, a, a few of, in, in Israel, and I'm only a few pages through it, but it's very, very good. But I really like Eleanor Catton. Eleanor Catton just won the Booker Prize, which is the preeminent uh, prize for a novelist in Britain. And she's a, a Canadian, I believe, who grew up in New Zealand, or she could be a New Zealander who grew up in Canada. And she wrote a wonderful book called The Rehearsal, a novel a few years ago. And she's really, really young. Like she's the youngest person by about 10 years to ever won this prize. So she wrote a one, she's got a wonderful voice. Uh, one, one, one novel that I really, really uh, like, uh, I don't know if you, it's called The, the, the Vintner's Luck. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, no, uh, I haven't. I don't know that one. And, and, and I, and I well, I t it, it's, a, it's a, a love triangle between a, a, a man a bisexual man, a woman, and an angel in early 19th century Provence. And it is one of the most amazing novels I've ever read. And everyone I've ever given it to has given it to all their friends. It, it's just incredible. I can't even, why this, why this woman has won, won prizes? Why is why, you know, been not made into a movie, a big movie? I don't know. But bizarrely, uh, we both do Twitter. Well, we all do Twitter, don't we? And, and yes. Twitter is endlessly surprising. One morning I got up uh, and before breakfast I just switched on the computer and I found that Elizabeth Knox, the author of The Bintler's Luck, who lives in the backwaters of New Zealand, was following me and I've got no idea why. So this okay. woman who, write, who wrote this fantastic novel that I really love started following me and I've got absolutely no idea why. Anyway, so. <laughs> Did you start a conversation? <laughs> I did. The bizarre thing is I, I immediately tweeted, Elizabeth Knox is following me. And she didn't really reply, so I'm spooked out, really. You know, uh oh, she's like, whoops, that was a mistake. <laughs> she has retweeted my things, but okay. she hasn't actually directly replied to me, so I'm completely spooked out, and if she sees this, um, I hope I haven't embarrassed her. Well, I mean, did you, did you try and DM and say, oh, I love your book? No, you I haven't. Know? I'm too shy. I'm too shy. Oh. But you do, you know, this incredible thing happens that these people that you really admire start following you on Twitter. For, and it's just, just amazed. You know, I'm amazed. You know like we mentioned Brian May before. Brian May does as well. Yeah. And, and I, it's weird, isn't it? Weird. It, yeah. it is pretty neat. Like one day Lisa Randall followed me and I went, Wow. Oh, Lisa Randall. And I went, 
she has a book coming out, I'm sure. You know? <laughs> 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 which now, which now is that we're... so wonderful and flattering because, you know, people, though I like their books, and if I get the chance, I, I promote, even if I can't do a video. Or, or now I've got this, which is so much better. It's talking to authors and, you know, just so exciting for me. And now Jeff, that... I know, loves it too. So Yes. Now that we're down to our last 45 seconds or so, and we can ask the tough questions. <laughs> I have... <laughs> I have one more, and Joanne, no, will no. Recognize, yes, Joanne will recognize one of my favorite topics that seems to keep coming up with the people we talk to is deep time, and, you know, it comes up. We were talking about just a little bit about, about universal laws and how everything can be the same everywhere, but we assume that it is and it works well. And then there's this question of, was it the same every win, too? And... The part I wanted to quote from you said, one of the striking discoveries of science is that the climate of the Earth has not always been as it is. For instance, a whopping 90% of the past one million years has been an ice age. And I say, in the past one million years is nothing but a fraction of a percent of the Earth's age. And so the question always is, how hard is it to get people to stop and try to comprehend how deep deep time is? And how big a discovery was it for science? And is the failure to think about deep time at the root of a failure to understand climate change? Is it the root of, you know, evolution denialism? Um, what's the story here? I think deep time is In 45 seconds. Well, I mean, deep yeah. time is, yeah. a, is yeah. an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing because I, I really do admire these uh, 18th century um, um, scientists, you know, in Scotland and places like that that looked at mountains and, and began to realize that they've not always been there, you know. And, and so, for instance, they would find things like, uh, you know, fossil seashells on the top of a 10,000-foot-high mountain, you know, somewhere like, like Madeira or something. And they would think to themselves, how did those fossil seashells get there? And then they would think, well, well maybe this mountain was beneath the sea, you know, and maybe it's risen up gradually. But, of course, no one sees a mountain move in a human lifetime. So immediately you, you realize tens of millions of years, you know, vast numbers of human generations must have gone by. And, and this, 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 um, ama I mean, this amazing leap of the imagination that they had mm -hmm. to realize that there were these un unbelievable tracks of time, deep time, that were unimaginable. And of course, you know, it, it turned out that, that Darwin could never have actually, um, you know, come up with his idea of evolution by natural selection unless he knew about deep time because obviously the idea is that all organisms have morphed from an original uh, you know common ancestor and of course we do not see mostly apart from uh, um, bacteria becoming antibiotic resistant we don't actually see species changing in a human lifetime right. so immediately you need you need stretches of time of hundreds of millions maybe billions of years but this is amazing what uh, you know to, 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 to begin to even contemplate this I mean of course no one can get their head around it I mean even these people couldn't get their head around it we can't get their head around it it's just like trying to trying to get your head around the size of the universe. But 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 what an amazing uh, leap of the imagination to start realizing that that the, the Earth has, has existed for vast tracts of time and it's not always been the way it is today. Yeah. Excellent, excellent for 45 seconds. <laughs> so, so we're, we're going to take another couple minutes and and make sure uh, we haven't forgotten to ask you something that maybe you wanted us to ask and you know if there's something you'd like to share with our audience before we part is that a question <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's, it's your what opportunity like to, share to say with, whatever you uh, want to the audience well that, that's put me on the spot hasn't it yeah. um, <laughs> I don't like, know like really what to say, but... to say what what's really most important about your book or uh, well, most important about my book. Well, yeah. it's, it, what can I say about my book? I could summarize it. It's about everything. It's about how the how the world of the twenty first century works. You know, if it's all gone by past you in a blur, you know, hopefully my book will bring you, you know, quickly and painlessly up to speed, you know, um, and, and I really, really enjoyed it. It's just, it's, it's, it's fantastic to go way beyond your normal comfort zone. And, you know, for me personally to learn about, from Joanne, about cell biology and all this kind of stuff has been, it's been really wonderful. I've really enjoyed it. 
That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us uh, and Marcus today uh, for a really lovely chat. And if you haven't read any, any of his books, you will see uh, they, they are really a friendly voice, a fun voice, and he just takes you um, on this journey to learn more about the world around us. So, okay. Uh, thank you all, and we will see you again in a few weeks because Jeff is taking off to Rome, and we'll see you again uh, in November. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>